a, he's in the law school, and uh, he uh, works a lot. And so initial work was in law and medicine, but now his work is increasingly in health and development economics. So um, I think we were supposed to work uh, visit and I was not only to give this talk and meet uh, and other folks, but also on a very interesting experiment on him with Seba. Yeah, that's on right. Him. Think about health insurance when people don't know much about health so what are the issues that happen when you try to implement such uh, uh, It's very different from otherwise when typically you have like yeah. yeah. So um, so uh, welcome to the So here's a, here's a very long bio. I won't read the entire bio. But, uh, you can easily look him up on online. He's also on Twitter, very active on Twitter. So, uh, Just when I'm traveling and I have <laughs> <laughs> trouble sleeping. And see his thoughts. So today he's going to talk about the effect of health insurance in India. Um, randomized control trial, and uh, you know, I think uh, for some of you, I might have talked about the RAND trial, RAND health insurance trial earlier, uh, which was very influential in the 1970s in the US, um, and so uh, I'm familiar with that work, and I have seen some snippets of this work that look forward to this talk, so that's one of the I want to work, and hopefully we get a chance to walk you around this. That'll be great, and so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thanks for, for for inviting me, uh, and I apologize for the snafu that didn't allow me to meet uh, some folks before. Uh, but hopefully, we'll get a little bit of time afterwards. Um, so Tarun's right. This is uh, work that's motivated by the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. So in the United States, uh, we've had two very big health insurance experiments done uh, that have had a huge impact on uh, uh, healthcare financing policy. So you might have heard of something called the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010. Uh, it's mainly a reform, for the most part, if you look at where the money has been spent, on trying to uh, uh, reform and expand health insurance, healthcare financing. Um, now, in India, um, around the time the Affordable Care Act was um, uh, being passed in the United States, uh, there was also a major uh, expansion of healthcare financing. It was uh, Rasya Swasthya Yojana, RSBY, passed in 2008. Uh, and it had a strange history we can get into in the Q&A. Uh, but it was an understudied program. Uh, you know, there were folks in India that were studying it a little bit, but there wasn't the same sort of rigorous evaluation of that program uh, that was planned like there was for health insurance on the Grand Health Insurance Experiment in the late 70s, early 1980s, or the Medicaid program uh, with the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment that was done uh, around 2010 in the United States. And so I thought, let's, uh, let's do something like that. Um, and, and, and the reason why is because if you spend some time looking at uh, healthcare financing, healthcare policy across countries, uh, from low, middle, low income countries to middle to high, once they embark on this path of healthcare financing, they tend to expand it. And so, you know, my prediction was India starts with RSBY. If it, you know, makes it out of the cradle, if that's just going to continue. Now, that was a prediction that actually turned out to be not incorrect. PMJ expanded the coverage, RSBY covers, we'll talk about it, low poverty line population, um, uh, and, and a few occupational groups that were vulnerable, uh, but then PMJ expands that, uses SEC to expand it to uh, eligibility is about 537 million people. Uh, it also expanded on the, I would call it the, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, vertical and, and, and horizontal expansion. It also expanded on the vertical expansion, uh, Dimension in the sense that it expanded the coverage that each household would get, uh, whereas uh, it's 30,000 coverage, 30,000 rupees per annum per household coverage in RSPY, PMJ expands it to, to uh, um, five lakhs. Um, so you see this expansion. So our goal was uh, let's do this experiment uh, in the fashion of brand um, and then see what happens. Uh, uh, and that will hopefully have influence on or provide information to uh, to future expansions and the design of those expansions. Now, um, I'm going to, there's a whole bunch of uh, details that go into that. Uh, uh, I think the most important thing to remember is, uh, for me, the big takeaway was uh, a methodological point. RCTs are slow, policy is fast. Uh, you know, within the first two years of doing this project, before we had any results whatsoever, the government was coming back to us first at the state level talking about RSBY and how to design that, then later on uh, when, uh, when PMJ is announced in 2018, working with uh, some combination of NHA and Niti asking questions 
about the program before we had results. So that's an important lesson when we think about doing RCTs for the purpose of policy design. We have to make sure that the speed uh, that we gather and evaluate data is commensurate with the pace of policy change. And that's something important. Okay, so let's begin. So this is a big project uh, to, uh, for, uh, you know, our goal and mission was to do something on the level of RAND, uh, the level of Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. So we have, you need a big team. So we have this uh, nice, uh, diverse team. You can see all the names on, uh, on the board. Uh, the ones that I would like to highlight is Koske and Mai uh, uh, worked on the uh, Seguro Popular study, Cynthia Kinnan, uh, Alexander Ruina, and Gabriel Conti. Uh, those are uh, each taking, they have certain types of specialization. They're brought on specifically to add that to the study. I think that's an important uh, uh, lesson in how you design large scale RCTs. Uh, obviously, the other, Shailander, Phoebe, uh, 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 Bartek, and Morgan. Uh, these are people that actually move the project forward. Okay, so uh, I think people in this room probably know about the healthcare system in India, so I'll try to do this very quickly. So uh, uh, there are challenges in the provision of healthcare in India. I think the most important thing to emphasize is that there's limited supply uh, of healthcare, especially in rural areas. So 70% of the population lives in villages, but only 40% of the healthcare workforce actually are villages. Uh, about two-thirds of the people uh, that do get care, uh, I think this is an underappreciated point, get care from private uh, sector facilities rather than public sector facilities. And that's a, uh, 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 and one of the roles that healthcare financing can play is to enable them to actually get that care. By contrast, in public facilities, you can get subsidized care. But there's a limited supply of, of healthcare. Uh, there's also inadequate financing. So these are also statistics quite common. 60% of spending uh, is out of pocket. Contrast that to the United States, it's only 11%. Uh, India is, now, you're tempted often to say that means India it does not have enough insurance. I think these are two different things because you can also borrow and save uh, in order to uh, get access to health care. And that's something important to think about that's underexplored. So I prefer to think of it as how much are you paying immediately out of pocket as opposed to credit markets or insurance. Um, uh, this, uh, this fact is also related to this fact, which is that uh, um, uh, this expenditure can cause people, can drive people into poverty. Uh, so statistics that we see are something like 60 million uh, uh, persons uh, per year pulled into, uh, pushed into poverty uh, due to cost. But another neglected component of this is that there's a whole bunch of people that worrying about this uh, neglect to get care. Okay, and that, that care is valuable, that's a cost. Okay. Now, uh, public spending on health care uh, is all, all remarkably low uh, in India. Uh, and I'm gonna give you two aspects of this, one that's on the slide, one that's not. Um, this is a slide that come that we don't make. It's taken from the press. It says health is a low priority. I, I don't actually agree that health is a low priority. I would I would prefer to say uh, health expenditure is a small share of India's economy. Uh, say three to four percent, perhaps. Maybe some estimates are a little bit lower, and it's not been growing tremendous. Like this is not a uh, a rate of growth that like is commensurate with our our economic status. Uh, but I'll I'll give you a positive view and a negative view. The negative view is that our expenditures as a percentage of GDP are low compared to some of these other countries, some of which we might consider peers. Let me give you the positive view. They're not our peers. They have much higher per capita income. And if you think about our per capita income here, uh, it's not obvious that India is out of line. I think you could make an argument that it's on the low end, but it doesn't, this exaggerates the, the gap a little bit. Um, so I think that it's small. Now, if you think about public component of that expenditure, as I told you, uh, much of the care is being provided by the private sector and not the public sector. That's, that's one component where you might say the public spending is small. The other thing I would point out is, uh, that's really helpful to think about is what percentage of our spending that's public is spent on, for example, two things, uh, building hospitals and training doctors on the one hand, the other one is doing like public health campaigns, vaccination campaigns, okay? Think about that and then ask yourself, how much is actually spent on healthcare financing? And the fraction spent on healthcare financing, which is the topic of this, is, is minuscule. It's a tiny percentage of the Ministry of Health's budget, okay? And it continues to do, be a small percentage, even under PMJ. So just keep those facts in mind as we think about this, sort of uh, uh, you know, paint, the, paint the background to, to this particular picture. Okay, so let's talk about India's healthcare financing policy. It's not just healthcare policy. Uh, so I told you about 2008, you have first national, there were, there were state level programs and they persist today, uh, but the first national program was Rasa Swasta Bhima Yojana, 2008, 
Uh, I told you already uh, that it was basically uh, the people that were eligible for low poverty line, certain occupational groups, so it's about 280 million people that were uh, supposed to be covered, uh, or eligible, I should say. Um, enrollment was only about 170 million. And I want to point out something. Because we're in India and we're used to large population numbers, we say only, this is arguably the world's largest health insurance program. Uh, um, so that's something really important to think about. If you want to think about contrast, the Guru Popular, which is Mexico's program, has 53 million. The Affordable Care Act has 31 million. Uh, we think of those as really big deals uh, uh, and uh, in healthcare policy and health economics. Like my, I started in health economics before I came to development economics, and those were big numbers. Even in development economics, those are pretty big. We're operating at a different scale. So uh, uh, to put that in perspective, uh, coverage, uh, it's, uh, so this is a vertical component rather than the horizontal component of coverage. How, what, is, what do you cover for each person that's actually eligible in, in, in hospital, uh, inpatient hospital care? So I think everybody knows here there's primary care, secondary, in Indian parlance, or in, 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 in India's parlance. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Tertiary is long-term care. Uh, secondary care is acute, short-term stays, but in hospital overnight. That's really what we're talking about here. And then there's primary care, which is out of facility. Uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, the degree to which ACA has operational problems, right? Or at least had operational yeah. problems. Yeah. That's quite immense. Yes. And uh, so, in that sense, you know, I'm just wondering how would you contrast not just this aspect of like coverage, but also how much state capacity is required. Yeah. You know, the big reason for, I think, India having low public expenditures, you know, it's not the same rupees that you spend, but it's also the amount of expertise and you know, technology and understanding and management capacity that you need to run stuff like this. And, you know, if, even if you double, double, double and triple the expenditure, you know, I don't think that it's all going to be all that expensive. It's yeah. effective simply because we don't have the ability to pay deliver on that. I completely agree. So let me just provide some color to, to what you said. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, because of what you said, uh, this program before, this uh, experiment even before it was completed, within two years of starting this experiment, we started a social service program specifically to help states implement various development programs, but uh, among them the actually uh, health insurance, including Karnataka's health insurance program. Um, so uh, you're exactly right, but let's kind of break it down in, into a framework. So the, so the first thing is, let's suppose that there's demand in the population for a health insurance program. You really have to roll that out. And, uh, and if you're gonna do it in a cashless basis, what does cashless basis mean? That means that uh, if you think about how insurance used to be a long time ago, 50 years ago, you would go to the hospital, you would pay, you take the receipt, then you send it to an insurance company. Cashless means you go to the hospital and the insurance company directly pays uh, the hospital. Okay, so in order to do that system, the hospital has to have a network. Okay, it has to have hospitals that, I said the, the health insurance company has to have a network. Hospitals that it deals with, that it's already vetted, and it has to have an, an IT system whereby it can send funds directly. Okay, that's non-trivial. You have to actually know who the facilities are. The government knew public facilities. It didn't always know private facilities. Had to check those private facilities, and then it had to build this IT system, and then had to train people in this IT system. Okay, so that was the first thing that is non-trivial. PMJ is still stuck on that. RSBOI was stuck on that for a long time. It meant that when we originally did this study, we wanted to work with claims data. And the problem is that claims data are still not available from RSBOI, even though it's now a defunct program. Uh, and that's a real problem. Uh, and, and if you probe into that, you will see how it was unclear who would own the data, would the states gather at the central, the, the central nodal agency, that would they have the data, things like that. Okay, so one thing is that infrastructure. That, but I've assumed that demand for health insurance was strong. That's, that's an incorrect assumption. It turns out demand for health insurance is not that strong. People don't know about what health insurance is, especially in rural areas. It's a new product. Uh, they've seen plenty of government programs come through that didn't actually pan out, and so there's a little bit of trust issue. Uh, so uptake has always been a big issue. Okay, then let's suppose that you get past that. Then there's a third layer of implementation, which is the prices. So one of the issues that comes up with RSPY is that they have very low prices. Now, if you're a hospital and you're deciding whether to participate in RSPY, you're going to care about whether or not the compensation that you get from this program is better than the compensation you'd get if you just sold that bed uh, for a particular night in the private market, right? In rural areas, 
uh, that's fine. The cost of production was low. Uh, this was really going uh, to, the, the, the cost of beds were, was really low. So the, the rates that, that, that RSPO was paying was reasonable. There was reasonable participation in rural areas. But in urban areas, there wasn't. It was very low levels of participation. Not only that, the hospitals that did participate, and this is not included in the study. There's a grad student that we had, uh, Sorjini Rao, that did work on this, that her, her PhD work uh, uh, helped reveal some of this, uh, which is that uh, uh, hospitals would impanel uh, in the urban areas, but a lot of them would have zero patients. And the reason they have zero patients is they just kept this as an option. But if patients, private pay patients, came along, they made more money from that, and they covered the cost. So that was a third layer of implementation that's really uh, a, a really a big deal. And there's a fourth layer of implementation. Let's suppose all that worked out. There's still the issue of whether or not the government actually wants to spend on health insurance. In the Indian government bureaucracy on health, there is not a consensus that healthcare financing is the strategy that the Indian government ought to take. Uh, um, and so as a result, you also have this issue that even if there was demand through utilization, the question was whether there was going to be enough financing provided by some combination of Ministry of Health because of priority and the Ministry of Finance because they wanted to actually spend on this. So you're exactly right. That's just kind of a breakdown of the litany of issues. Now, if you were going to solve this going forward, you have to address each layer. And, and, and I, don't, I think we've made some progress under PMJ. It's a, I think we've learned a lot about RSBY, from RSBY, but we haven't solved all four layers, or peeled all four layers of this day. OK. So moving forward, inpatient hospital care, 30,000 rupees per year per household. Uh, and uh, there's no deductible uh, and no copay. OK, I'm going to try to do this a little bit quickly, because uh, I'm going to actually come back to this with more details. This is a very high level uh, program. Um, by the way, this gets back to your question, Tharun. Uh, one of the reasons why there's no deductible and no copay is just because we think that'll deter use. But a second very important reason that's underappreciated is we don't have the capacity to implement the copay. Remember that IT system that you had to build for hospitals? You had to figure out a way that you would charge, say, if you have 10% copay, that you would take 90%, but then make sure the hospital did take that 10% of the remaining and not anything more. So Radhika Jain and Pascaline Dupas have some work on this in Rajasthan looking at balanced billing. It's, it's hard to monitor that sort of thing. Okay. All right. Uh, obviously, everybody now knows about PMJ. Uh, so in 2018, that succeeds RSBY and scraps RSBY, but replaces with something that is RSBY and then some. Uh, it adds some additional bells and whistles we can go into in the Q&A. Uh, but the eligibility, the main important thing that you'll remember is eligibility expands from 208 million to 537 million based off the SECC uh, data. Uh, the bottom, uh, 537 million, and coverage is a little bit deeper. So you have, you have now have tertiary hospital care. The amount per year is a little bigger, five lakhs. No deductible copay persists. Okay. There are a lot of other details if you're interested on administrative stuff that that uh, you know if you're interested in insurance design we can talk about. Okay. But the concerns here are still low uptake, <coughs> low utilization, and unknown health impact. These two things are now still being talked about with PMJ. This is something that's not talked about as much, but it's important. Is it worth, what's the ROI on this investment? Should we be spending money on, on this particular policy? Okay. Here, now, that was a, that, that's a policy-oriented view. Now, let me give you a research-oriented view. Um, I want to ask about three questions. So what's the, up, actually, there'll be a little bit of policy component of this, too, but uh, what's the uptake? Uh, so uh, in low-income countries, you have uh, not great field of fiscal capacity. Uh, but you want to provide universal insur universal coverage, how can you do that in an affordable way? Uh, is there a way that you could, uh, say for example, uh, means test it, being provided for free for the very poor, but then as you're working your way up the income scale, sell it. Uh, one benefit of that is that you actually reduce pressure on the fiscal, uh, on, the, on, the, on the fisc, the public fisc. Uh, and so that's one thing. Um, now there's a, there's a kind of, also another question is, is, is there just demand for insurance? That's another way of asking that question. And what does that demand for look like? Second question, utilization. Uh, what determines utilization? There's an old development economics, uh, development economics literature on technology adoption. It turns out this is a new form of technology. It's a financing technology. Uh, and so there's a question of, you know, the information on utilization can kind of tell you about the technology adoption in this particular sector. Um, there's also growing uh, evidence on, actually, it was there for you know, ag technology adoption too, but you know, there's a potentially a learning process uh, as you roll out these technologies and you want to learn about that learning process, you might ask that exact same question here, is uh, do people learn about health insurance which they don't know about by seeing what other people are doing? Uh, and, and what role does that play? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then there's obviously the kind of that standard health economics question, I think. 
which is, is there a health impact uh, from health insurance? Does it actually improve health? Um, you know, there was this big debate. Uh, development economics, uh, economists are not aware of this, maybe, but, but health economics uh, for the last, I would say, uh, 10, 15 years really focused on healthcare financing. And the first question uh, really is, uh, does health insurance improve health or is it mainly uh, a financing product that helps you smooth consumption? Um, I think the takeaway of the literature led by people like Amy Finkelstein has been it's, it's mainly a financial uh, instrument. There are some recent papers that, that suggest there's some health benefits in the United States, but it's really about financing and not so much about health consistent with RAND, consistent with the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. So you might ask, is that true in low-income countries? There's an argument for why that would be true and false in low-income countries. It, it could be true because, uh, in fact, people don't have access to health care unless they have the financing. And so it's going from no health care to health care rather than just financing out of pocket to health insurance. Uh, so that's an argument in favor of thinking that it have an impact on health. The argument against is maybe the, you know, listen to people like Jishnu Das, uh, you might say, oh, I don't think the quality of healthcare facilities in India are that great. So even if you give them, uh, you know, if you consume healthcare, it still won't make a difference. So that's, a, I think, an important question. Um, I already mentioned that, uh, uh, well, I didn't mention this part. There have been a number of RCTs done in low and middle income countries. Uh, so Kling et al. is in Mexico, House Hoppers in uh, Kenya, uh, but there's Nicaragua, there's Cambodia. Um, uh, but they have a relatively consistent view, consistent result. Uh, they have an impact on use, but not an impact on health. Now, what makes this a little bit different? Why do you need to do it here, uh, given those other studies have been done? In India, we like to say that India is different, but I don't like to, you know, that's not a very academic uh, or rigorous point. Um, uh, I think what, what's going on is that when you test these health insurance programs, you're testing two things. One is if you ran a program that was perfect, what would it look like? And the second thing is how do you run the program? So you're learning a little bit about both. Uh, so that's uh, important. Um, uh, and then I'll just say some one small thing. This is a much larger experiment than the experiments that have been done before in the health uh, insurance context. It's even bigger, I would argue, than the Seguro popular study, if you think about the sample size that we're done uh, and the duration of the study. Okay? And that's kind of important. If you think that the, the health impacts are, that you're not measuring them, for example, we didn't measure them in RAND or we didn't measure them in Oregon because the sample sizes are too small, maybe you can address that. I'll give you a little preview. No, we've still got little power. Yeah. So, This study is actually among the longest that's out there, 3.5 years. Uh, it's really hard to study a little bit longer because you've got to trace these people, and, and that's really difficult to do coming back all the time. Um, uh, but it seems a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, argument. Now, here's the argument. And, and by the way, it's an argument that's been made in the US. So the argument against RAND, the argument against Oregon, uh, has always been look at long-term effects. There's cumulative. The arguments on the other side say, are the following. The first one is, you only look at the benefit side of the equation. It turns out the longer you keep health insurance on, you also increase your costs because you're paying premiums each year or you're paying the healthcare costs each year, uh, depending on whether you're thinking about insurance or just actually just expenditures. And so you, what you want to do is you want to think about that cost-benefit analysis, and you'd have to make some argument that the cost-benefit analysis changes in the long run. Uh, so that means that the health benefits increase at a faster rate than the costs increase, which is, say, roughly linear. Um, a second issue is, in the U.S. context, there have been efforts to study this. Uh, Bernie Black has a, a nice paper uh, that looks at studies that, uh, that are longer period, and they're not finding an effect. Now, there at six years, uh, you can always say more. So that's the second argument. It's not obvious it's true. But the third thing I want to say is a, is a pure methodological point. 
health insurance is a very strange place where um, uh, we somehow think it must work. Now ordinarily when we go into a treatment, our null is not it works, our null is zero. And we say, all right, you've got to show and prove that it works. It's a commercial product, prove it works. And if you want to see how odd it is, switch the word health insurance with the word drug. And if I came in here and I said, you know, I've tested, I've got to create this new drug. I couldn't find that it works in 3.5 years, but you shouldn't reject the drug because it might work in the long run. You'd say, that's crazy, right? And so the question is, why is it with health insurance we switch that null either in a academic sense or, or a policy sense? And I just would be a little bit cautious about the. Yeah, I agree with that. The only thing is I would just say, if we were to treat health insurance on par as we treat drugs, even for drugs for rare events, yeah. our null should be zero on both, or positive unless you prove otherwise on both. That's all. As long as we're consistent, I think that's okay, but I, I don't think we're being entirely consistent. Um, and I think it's problematic because there are other things that we're not talking about here that are side effects of health insurance that we see in the United States haven't seen here yet that would complicate that because we're assuming that it's purely a private transaction between the insurance company and this, this uh, person. But uh, in the United States, you might make the argument, which many have, which is, look, by altering the price and separating people from the actual uh, point of sale price, uh, you really enable, for example, either higher expenditures, just the moral hazard argument, or higher rates of inflation because you're separated out from changes. So, yeah. So I think also have to do how supply side is I think that's a critical question. So, uh, and, and it, it, it's worth investigating. Uh, so, one of the challenges in India is we don't have a good uh, uh, census of healthcare facilities. Uh, there are two data sets that exist that provide it. They're not very high correlated. It's a highly correlated. Uh, Sam Asher has done some work trying to figure out with uh, with Radha Kajin, uh trying to figure out how correlated it is. He doesn't uh, his work doesn't instill a lot of confidence in the existing census. Maybe Health Stack will give us a little better sense of what's going on. But I do think it's critical to think about as we expand health insurance, even if we don't see impacts in health, do we see growth in facilities, which in itself can have collateral benefits because it also enables you to have private transactions outside of the public health insurance scheme. And there's a good historical reason for thinking that other countries, including the United States, have used health insurance to expand the supply side. Uh, and so you could imagine that as a policy. I, I, I'm not really interested in PMJ purely to provide health insurance. What I'm interested in is, is a form of subsidy to the health care facility. The question that arises in that context is, well, hold on. Do we want to provide money directly to, to uh, facilities, or do we want to filter it through health insurance? So in the United States, we've done both. Uh, we've had something called the Hill-Burton Act, where we provide direct subsidies to facilities. And then we've also had massive expansions like Medicare and Medicaid. One argument in favor of using public health insurance, or health insurance subsidies to, to promote supply side is because it depends on whether or not you think the government is better than the consumers at picking out facilities that are actually providing good services. So if you can pick and figure it out as the Ministry of Health or you know HHS, you can directly give the money, right? Uh, well, alternatively, you could give it to the patients, and the patients go to the facilities that they think are actually doing a good job. And so that way, you'd be directing the the money, the, 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 the financing in some sense, uh, for facility expansion towards the best facilities. But that's a very good, and it's an important policy question. Yeah, Go ahead. Pardon? Supply side is really speedy in the software. It takes a long time. It does take a long time. And so that might be, it ties back into Tarun's argument, which is that you've got to do public health insurance for a while. I, I want to point out something, though. Um, uh, I think that's true. We've now had uh, almost 14 years of experience. You can make an argument that we don't actually spend a lot. I already told you that at the very, very beginning. The question is how long and how much do you have to spend to see the supply side? And then I think a critical thing for us as academics in providing input into policy is we need to give some feedback to the, to the Ministry of Health and to the government generally. Are these programs actually expanding supply? We don't know if that's the case. So let's suppose we know the supply is increasing. I don't know if the supply is increasing because the private sector is just doing its thing and growing. It grows in lots of different areas or it's responding to RSPY and PMJ? I'd like to know the answer to that question. I think 
I'm not going to be able to answer all that in the RCT because just the idea of designing an RCT that includes an arm that gives money, that's going to be hard. But I will do the following. I'm going to give you four different arms uh, at the household level that are going to give you uh, at least one of those arms is designed to be at least budget neutral. Uh, so something that's a little bit more realistic. Uh, so, so I'll get to a little bit of this, which is what if I give you cash instead of giving unconditional cash rather than giving you a, 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 a subsidized premium. Um, so that doesn't span the range of policy options, but you're exactly right that the counterfactual matters. This is going to give you a narrow set of counterfactuals, and, and we can debate whether or not it's a useful counterfactual, but there's going to be some questions I'm going to leave on the table. And I do think that this line of questioning is very important. Well, I would like to, you know, say, to draw, uh, you may say, reference from the Indian context. Yeah. And here, of course, we have national policy to have been which is on side also, no? the most important uh, Rehabilitation yeah. uh, All the products that are today there in insurance in Africa are demanding that you go for hospitalization. Yeah. Which means that we are focusing on needing care alone. Health care insurance or health insurance is synonymous, or you may say identical to only needing care that you need in the hospital. Yes. So people are not in a position to get any kind of a benefit uh, towards a whole lot of out of pocket. In the Indian context, as you will be knowing, uh, the percentage of the GDP on public health is low. Mm -hmm. But believe me, the private health expenditure, private medical expenses, are indeed, indeed horrendously high, particularly from the LIG and you know, the humanity yeah. So in that particular manner, I would think in that particular context, I would like to know from you whether there is a thought really in, in the US or in India to go for some other kind of insurance business models. I mean, supposing somebody is going for promotive tax and spending money in order to keep himself healthy, is there any kind of a coverage? All you talk about preventive, is there anything you know, that is available? Or if somebody is in a position to show that, you know, he has taken an insurance but is remaining healthy, whether he gets kind of an incentive. Uh, the fact that, you know, say you are shown over here, that randomized controlled trials, RCTs, you know, that, 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 that give you a, a kind of a picture of the impact on the use and on health. I tend to agree with that because I would like to cite only one, you know, say, illustration of Manubai Shao, who is a teacher at IIM, and who later on found, found a key RC, since consumer education research who told me when the doctors were on strike in Chicago and New York, the Morgan City and Mortality both came down in those places. Yeah. So going, going back to now this is something which we cannot ignore. We need to let's go look at the facts. Yeah. So I personally think that uh, whatever we are doing, we need you know, to modify, adapt that to the Indian conditions. Because even for one health program now, one health is going to be different for India than one health you know, for Sweden or America. Okay. So I'll say three things. One oh, is not lighthearted. I've covered quite a few things, but yeah, yeah, no, you, can, I, you can answer. I'll, I'll, I'll give you three things. One lighthearted, I encourage you to read Bapu Jenna's paper on uh, uh, cardiology conferences. Uh, so uh, when he looks to see what happens to patient outcomes when, the, when there's a famous cardiology conference in the United States, so the top cardiologists go, consistent with what you said, uh, uh, healthcare outcomes improve when the, when the doctors go away. Uh, so, you know, interesting question. But that's, let, let's put that aside because that's not going to be the first thing. Let's do the, the more important thing. And I want to talk about two things. I'll say that out loud so that I remember to hit both of them. One of them is separating policy into a free insurance, free healthcare versus health insurance that's not free. You have to pay a preview. That's going to be the first thing. The second one is I want to talk about administrative issues. Um, and let me just actually get rid of the administrative issue. Here is a challenge. You know, people say, oh, let's do health care. Why doesn't health insurance provide for primary care? And it does at the very right tail of the income distribution. But you really need to think about, from the business side, what do you need to do in order to set up a health care, health insurance program that covers primary care? Think about the primary care sector in India. Small folks that run clinics, some of them are, uh, uh, you know, uh, licensed, some are not as licensed. You know, there's a, a very political, politicized debate about quacks that go on. 
You have to choose between these folks, not get into trouble, and then you have to also track them to make sure they actually provided care. So let's put them into Tarun, Dr. Tarun, and, and, uh, and I said, I got care. But the insurance company has to know that I actually got care, and Dr. Tarun's not just, uh, that Tarun's not just uh, 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 billing. And that's, that's hard to do. And so one of the reasons why India started with hospital care is because there are fewer facilities that are hospitals than there are primary care physicians. And we don't have even a very good uh, uh, census of, of hospitals, let alone of physicians. So just a pure administrative task. As an administrative task, it's very hard to set private care. And if you think, oh, well, the US doesn't. No, the US at the start, each of those programs, Medicare and Medicaid, start out as hospital programs. Medicare added physician care part B later. And it was a small component of it. It was neglected as a small percentage of the budget and only expanded later. Now it's a big component of it. But it took a long time for that to occur. That's, that's that very last thing. But now I want to separate out uh, something here. Let's suppose you care about primary care and you care about, uh, uh, um, and, then, and then maybe you think secondary care is, is not as important. So if you are selling insurance, selling insurance, not subsidizing insurance, what do you want to do? Do you want to, we call it first up, do you want to provide first dollar insurance? The answer is no. If the, your goal is to, to help people uh, be able to smooth their non-medical consumption in the face of healthcare shocks, you want to insure the big shocks, not the small shocks. And so you want to go after hospital insurance rather than primary care insurance because the bills are small. Now they can be a high percentage of the actual expenditure, but they're not, the variation is not that high. So the insurance benefits are not that great. That's why when we think about insurance, it makes sense to do secondary and maybe tertiary care, but more secondary care because tertiary care is sometimes predictable uh, rather than primary care. Now, but then why, what about, why do we worry about primary care? First, it's a large percentage of it. The actual spending percentage, it's a large number, even though the variation's not high. But when we think about that, we don't want to think about insurance in that context. We just want to provide free primary care directly, right? And, and it's really about making it affordable to people. It's really about targeting poor individuals. So in that context, when we think about subsidizing care or subsidizing insurance, we're really, that's why we get confused. I think what's really intellectually helpful is to separate out insurance from paying for the premiums or paying for care. And for primary care, I think the latter is good. But for us, we want to think about the insurance. This program, this insurance uh, experiment is going to try to address both, OK? I'm going to go just a little bit faster for a little bit. I, the nice thing is I'm from Chicago. I know that we're supposed to do all the previews first. So you'll get all the results before we actually dive deep. So that's not so bad. You'll still uh, you'll see it, still see everything, OK? All right, here's the intervention. Uh, this is a study that Again, we designed to be a longer term study because of concerns that Devin uh, raised. Uh, so it's 2013 to 2019. It's actually 3.5 years of follow-up, so not six years of follow-up. Uh, it's very large. Uh, it's, uh, we're gonna show you some 11,000 households uh, uh, with roughly 55,000 uh, members or so uh, uh, included in this. Um, uh, it's in Karnataka in two districts uh, uh, so that we can get some sense of what, what it's like in South India, so Mysore and then People always debate me about this. When you go to Gulbarga, I think of it as uh, something a little bit more like central uh, India. It looks a little bit more like Maharashtra than it does uh, rest of Karnataka. And so I would argue that it gives you a little sense of what, what's going on in central uh, India. Uh, and here's the trick. Uh, uh, and this is out of necessity. We couldn't study BPL populations. And the reason is because they already have access to RSBY, right? So you don't have any control group. If you want a control group, you've got to study the APL population. I mean, you might say, well, that's not relevant to RSBY. And I would argue, no, it's actually relevant to what was going to happen next, which is the expansion of eligibility, which then does actually happen under PMJ. Um, people were assigned to four arms. Why did we do four arms? Because we wanted to answer intellectual questions, but also policy questions. So the four arms are free insurance which is a mix of paid insurance plus a subsidy for the insurance, but it's an in-kind subsidy, you have to buy the insurance. Second is just sale of insurance. Okay, sometimes in, econo in health economics we call that pure insurance. Okay, I'm gonna sell. A third is a budget neutral answer, right? So this is a counterfactual, it's not the exact counterfactual you asked for, but it's still policy relevant, which is government spending the same amount of money, except it's giving out the money in the form of an a, a, a unconditional cash transfer. Also addresses many, any, any income effects associated with uh, not perfectly, but associated with income effects associated with free insurance, which bundles the two, and then obviously a new intervention control. And then the real issue is just interpreting these things. Now, what you'll find is we went in thinking, oh, this is great. We're going to give you all these pieces and what the impact is. But you see a lot of null results, and so it's not really going to be useful to you know, slice and dice very carefully. The answer is going to be uh, utilization, yes. Uh, health, uh, not so much. Okay. Um, we do another thing, which is Again, we're influenced by the development economics literature too, which is technology adoption and the potential for 
uh, spillover. Spillover is going to happen because of learning. There's also spillovers that can happen through crowd out, which you see in, like, for example, the weather insurance context. There's also uh, 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 spillovers that can happen through congestion. Let's suppose you give juice up demand, but supply is limited. Then that could be a little bit of a problem that would limit the, the impact. And so, so we thought we'd look at uh, introduce spillovers by varying the fraction of households in each village uh, that get insurance. So I'll give you more details on how that's uh, done. Uh, we did, again, two follow-ups, 18 months and 3.5 years, so that we can get uh, two rounds. So for example, contrast uh, Consigo Popular, that's one year. Okay. Uh, even uh, uh, Oregon uh, is, is relatively short compared to this. Okay, so this is just tooting our horn. Uh, don't, not really that deep. This is one of the largest, it is the largest, we think, health insurance experiment in an emerging economy. Uh, uh, we, we hopefully hope to inform policy. Uh, first to look at spillovers in this context, it's been done in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the weather insurance context, but not so much in the health insurance context. And that's true uh, even in, uh, 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 high income countries. Uh, we talked about how it can be a positive spillover because of learning, uh, but it could also be, um, uh, and also there's some benefit of maybe risk sharing that goes on when you're setting up an insurance program, but there's also the negative part, which is the, the congestion and crowd out. Okay. All right, give you a quick preview of the results. Uh, remarkable uptake. Now I'm going to give you some background. RSBY, which gave out free insurance to a BPL populations had an uptake of 60% on average, okay? We hit 60% for the group, again, this is an APL population, right? We hit 60% for the group that is offered insurance for sale, okay? Now you might ask, well, is that just because they were richer? I'm gonna give you a preview of the answer, no, because within our population, there was heterogeneity that we measure income uh, uh, and assets, and there's, so there's heterogeneity within that. Um, and as it turns out, just because you're APL doesn't mean that you're not below the BPL line. It just means that you don't have a BPL card. Uh, and as you look at that and you say, oh, well, do I find greater uh, uptake into pay, uh, sold insurance uh, uh, as your income increases? The answer is no. Uh, so it's not obvious that it's just purely uh, uh, an income effect. So we, we suspect that it's a bit of a marketing effect. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's actually RSVY. So, so the most important thing to remember from an from a, uh, experiment administration perspective, this is how it works. We went around a whole bunch of states, tried to find a state that was willing to cooperate with us. Uh, we also tried to find a, a policy that looked like uh, RSVY from the private sector. Uh, we couldn't find that one that works. We ultimately decided we're just going to work with the government. So the key thing was finding a state that was willing to actually give people that were not formally eligible access to RSVY. And so working with RSVY in Delhi, and RSBY in Karnataka, we actually provided RSBY to an ineligible group. Um, they had the same enrollment trucks, everything was the same. The only difference in marketing was the following. In RSBY, what happened is that if you were in a village and uh, the enrollment truck was gonna come for the time of year that it usually comes, they will just hand out chits to the people that are eligible. You were APL, so you didn't get the chits. And then it will tell you what day they were gonna come. They would come and you'd find your way to the truck. Okay, and if you did, you enrolled. Otherwise, you had to go to the, uh, the nodal office in the district. Okay, uh, sometimes in the, in the block to enroll. The only thing that we did different than that uh, is that we went to the APL households, they got the chips, but they, we also went the day of the actual truck arriving and went to their houses and said, hey, now you can enroll, hey, you can now enroll, and we pointed them to where the truck is. That's the marketing difference. We think this result is more likely to be driven by that fact than it is by the income fact but again, it's only because we can't see any correlation between income and enrollment in the sold arm. Okay. Unconditional trash transfer, you get slightly lower enrollment, so you get the opportunity to buy, but you also get an unconditional cash transfer equal to the premium, right? Uh, you get a pretty good uptake, but it's not, and it's, it's higher than this, but it's not gonna be as high as conditioning uh, uh, the, uh, 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 conditioning the money on buying the insurance. So that's 72%. Uh, so 12% change, and then you get up to 78% enrollment if you provide free insurance, which is over, which is 20 percentage points, almost 20 percentage points, uh, higher than uh, RSBY actually experienced. Okay, um, uh, what's really important is that there, there have even been health insurance experiments done uh, in India. The, I think the biggest one, uh, the most notable one, is Banerjee Duplo and Hornbeck. Rick is uh, a colleague of mine at University of Chicago, and he warned me. For a bunch of times before doing this experiment, not to the experiment based on his experience. Fortunately, we had a slightly different experience. 
uh, they found very little uh, uptake into insurance. Their context was different, and we can talk about that context, but uh, what they found was dramatically different than this. They found very little demand. We found a lot of demand for, for the insurance product. Okay. And that there's a slope to this. The slope, by the way, on this is just the immediate, like the, if you look at the literature on the demand for insurance, not the demand for healthcare, but this is well within the range of elasticity. It's close to the median elasticity you see in studies. Second result, utilization. This is like the, the second kind of positive result that you find. Uh, insurance use increases with uh, uh, both access and uh, enrollment, right? So we're gonna give you an IT estimate, we're gonna give you a treat, treatment untreated TOT estimate as well. Um, the effects fall over time, so successful use at six months, in over six months, I wanna point this out. So if you wanted to, if you didn't think there was any serial correlation utilization for a second, and, and you wanna do this on an annual basis, you double it. Uh, but it's 6% uh, of uh, uh, increase in utilization. Um, and then uh, um, at 3.5 years, you get uh, a little bit less. Uh, so it fades over time. It's possible that you do that. Uh, the, the real issue is whether or not the hospitalization early affects the hospitalization later. It's also, and one way to test for that, and well, there's a second possibility, which is you used early, and so you didn't use later, that's very associated. Um, there is no serial correlation in utilization later, conditional on utilization earlier. And so if that were true, you'd find that, neg that, that negative serial correlation, we don't see that. So does the To make what? No, in our experiment, basically you enrolled once and then you were automatically renewed to the process. In RSPY, did have to, okay? Uh, but the way RSPY is run towards the end, is that I think they had a sense that the program was not gonna, not getting the support that it needed, and so they actually often did just re-enroll even BPL populations without going out a second time. It was an automatic process. Uh, okay. Uh, but the other surprising result that we got, which is consistent with the recent RCT done uh, by that same group, Banerjee and Flow, but also including people like Ben Olkin, uh, in Indonesia, they found that people had trouble, uh, when you offer insurance, had trouble figuring out how to enroll in insurance. Well, we found something that's related, which is once you're enrolled, you still have trouble trying to figure out how to use insurance. So the, pe the fraction of the population that, uh, the, this, these are treatment effects, uh, the fraction of the population that when they enroll, they had trouble actually utilizing it. They tried, but they couldn't do it. 3.5 percentage points, uh, and uh, even at, at, uh, at, at 3.5 years, you're fine. 2% of the population. 2% increment uh, um, tried to use it but couldn't. And, and we actually, uh, we can talk about it if we want to, we did a consumer feedback survey, like why is it that you had difficulty using it? It's both supply and demand side stuff. So a lot of it is people forget their card, they didn't know where they could use it, etc. And then there's also a lot of supply side stuff which is the hospital's IT system wasn't working, uh, uh, things like that, okay? So there's a little bit of both. It, it's obviously, that's not a causal estimate, that's just trying to figure out what, what happened. The other thing I want to point out, uh, which you're not seeing in this figure, is that there's positive spillover effects, which is, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is the, the your probability of utilizing it is uh, uh, utilizing the treatment condition on, on having enrolled or getting access to it is increasing in the fraction of the population that also either got access to insurance or, utilized, or, or enrolled in insurance, okay? Uh, so, so this is spillovers, it's consistent with learning because it's in the positive direction rather than the negative uh, direction. Not significant impacts on health, and we measured a ton of health outcomes, and not all of them were, uh, the vast majority were subjective in the sense that we were asking you, you know, do you have this, do you have that, etc. But a lot of, there's a bunch of anthropometric measures as well. I think we'll debate about whether or not those are super informative, but you get a range of estimates, but very few, a very small number are actually statistically significant. And what's the other, other thing that's interesting, it's not always positive, right? So you're going to get some negative effects too on the health. And self-reported. Our takeaway is, uh, you know, if you if you did if you ignored standard errors for a second, right? And you said, you know, sometimes when you make policy, you can't always ask for 95% confidence. You got to decide. We're not finding, uh, you know, uh, uh, clear positive benefits. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, think about standard errors, um, they're wide. You, you make the argument that even this study is not powered enough, and that's fine. I think that's a recurring theme uh, uh, in this literature in the health economic side. Um, 
Uh, we have another paper that's about to be posted on, on selection, so you might be concerned about adverse selection. That's not the top line result in the paper that I circulated. Um, but we find very little evidence that they're cost sharing is associated with adverse selection. This is distinct from the uh, uh, Banerjee Duflo Hornbeck paper, which basically said there can be no adverse selection if there's no demand. Well, here there's clearly demand, uh, but we find very little adverse selection in any case. Uh, there's not, uh, so there are two ways that you can measure adverse selection. You can say, like, oh, I'm going to look at uh, baseline health, or I'm going to look at baseline health care expenditures. Uh, on, on neither level do we find significant, so no evidence by baseline health. We also try to do predictions uh, through just ML on, on the vast uh, amount of variables that we have at midline. Uh, even using those ML predictions, uh, we're not finding a lot of adverse selection. Uh, so that's that. Okay. I mean, that's some degree of foundation in insurance. Yeah. So how do you explain the absence of investigation? People don't know what the product it, it actually does. So it's sort of random yeah, you don't actually know if you're a high user of healthcare or not a healthcare. You don't know how that, that like exactly what insurance is doing. So uh, uh, even if you're a high healthcare, uh, a high healthcare consumer or a sicker consumer, you don't know. You haven't really made. It seems really weird for economists to think about this, but I just want to. Why not make the connection that what it's doing is the more healthcare you consume, the better this pro this financial product is. So it could be either one of those two things. People can't predict their health, or they can't. Uh, they haven't figured out that this is a financing mechanism for their health care needs. Okay. I can't distinguish both those two, but those are those are two flaws. So, um, and, and I, so Darun pointed out a tweet I think I recently sent out, which is about the design of health care, and it is true that I, so we do two things with Sewa. On the one hand, we have a subsequent experiment where we're trying to try out a new type of, uh, of a health insurance program. It's not new, it's called Hospicash. Everybody kind of should have heard of it, which is you just get an indemnity payment rather than pay for your, your care. Uh, so we're trying that out and estimating demand for that. But a second thing that we do and work with them on is just try to think about how do you actually price a health insurance scheme when the health insurance, and privately, uh, when people don't know what this product is. Uh, and that it's a different sort of adverse selection where the consumer doesn't actually know as opposed to the consumer knowing their own risk and the hospital and the health insurance company not knowing. So it's a different, it's not a, a Rothschild Stiglitz result. It's going to be something, something a little bit more like Akerlof lemons. Uh, but that's uh, an interesting question that comes up that's connected to what you were talking about. Okay. So the setting, I think uh, this is where I've given you the preview so you know the results. So now I'm going to go a little bit slower uh, uh, through some of this in case you're having questions about the detail. So we're down in Karnataka, 435 villages uh, in Gulbarga and Mysore. Uh, the elderly criteria, and this is a very important point, we pick villages that were 25 kilometers from, uh, from impaneled hospitals. Now, why is that important? Well, in some sense, we're giving you high estimates of the value of insurance because we're not even considering the people that don't have hospitals around. If you include those guys in, what is the, value, what is the demand for insurance? It's going to be even lower because there's no impaneled hospital, right? Uh, you, if you got the insurance, you weren't going to get uh, much of a result. So that's something to keep in mind. This was very early on. We were working with, uh, you know, just like asking people in the in the community, thinking about health insurance in in, in government, in, in think tanks like PHFI. Uh, and one of the first salient comments we got was, you know, just really obvious: health insurance has no value. You've got no hospital. Okay. So looking at APL households, our exclusion criteria is you were BPL. You were otherwise RSBI eligible because you were one of those vulnerable groups, uh, occupational groups, or you already had hospital insurance already. We kept those people out. Now, one thing to remember is that this goes on for long enough that you might become BPL, and so you'll actually find, if you look at the paper, in the control group, some people actually end up using an RSBY card. And you're like, how is that possible? You didn't give it to them. It's because they became eligible by falling below the poverty line or getting a BPL card and were able to get it. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. Um, uh, we did a listing exercise, got a large number of households, and then we uh, uh, picked from those households. Uh, ultimately, we got 10,879 households enrolled, 52,000 uh, 50, oh, 50, yeah, 52, uh, individuals uh, in those households. Um, and uh, we chose these numbers so that we'd be powered to uh, detect a 25% change in hospitalization uh, uh, and allow for 10% attrition. Okay, so it's, you know, 95% uh, uh, confidence, 80% power. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get that. Yeah. Uh, do I, I don't have network data uh, at the village level. Uh, it's during this time that you see a lot of those studies being done, which are very high uh, effort studies, but we were doing them. Okay. I'm going to skip over the characteristics of the sample village so that we can get forward. Uh, there's nothing 
particularly remarkable here. Uh, uh, these do not seem, uh, so the relevant framework for us was in those districts, do our villages look different? And the answer was no. So you can get census data on what those villages look like, compare that to what our villages look like. Mm -hmm. It's in the ballpark, right? It, it, it's not uh, at any of the extremes uh, for those two districts. Now, let's talk about RSBY. Uh, again, we've gone through some of this. Uh, uh, I think the only really new thing that we want to point out is, uh, if you think about the eligibility for RSBY, the actual program, not our study, uh, you know, the PPL population, you might ask, like at this time, what is the PPL population? So in 2012, that's an annual income of 54,000 uh, rupees. Uh, in rural areas, 65,000 uh, rupees. In urban areas, for a family of five. Okay, so just to put some reference if you think in terms of uh, 2012 rupees, that still makes sense. Um, uh, coverage, uh, it covers up to five members of the household. Uh, we already talked about this, you have to be in a panel hospital. A really interesting thing from an administration perspective is that it includes public hospitals. It seems really strange, right? You can already get subsidized care public hospitals by going to insurance. Well, that's a really important way to interpret, important thing to think about when you're interpreting RSBY. What RSBY is really doing is giving you the ability to go to private hospitals. You could already go to the public hospital. So that's really what's going, uh, you know, if you think about what this is going to do. Um, there's a little bit of travel expenses, but they're really minor that are covered, 100 rupees per event. I already told you about this and the cap. Let's talk about pricing. Uh, so, you know, in, in theory, RSBY is supposed to be free, but, but as it turns out, you have to pay for the card, which, by the way, maybe there's two reasons. There's really an administrative reason. So we had uh, RSBY would pick private companies to go out and do the enrollment and you needed to give the private company an, an actual incentive to go and hand out the card. And so uh, they would give you a card, and to give you an incentive to give you the card, you would give them 30 rupees. So the goal of the 30 rupees was to incentivize the agents that were actually doing the distribution, okay? Now you can tell another story which is, oh, you know, people won't value something if they don't pay a little bit. And we can tell that. I think of that as more of a post hoc explanation than the actual explanation if you talk to people that are actually administrating the program. Uh, so you had to pay a $30, 30 rupee, uh, 30 bucks smart card fee. Uh, the government paid the annual premiums. The premiums are incredibly low. This is one of those things that, that motivated that discussion I had, which is RSBY has declining premiums over time, which is very strange because we usually think it's going to go the other way. We're worried about adverse selection, things like that. No. Uh, as it turned out, that wasn't, uh, 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 it, it actually fell over time. And there's, again, we spent a lot of time on administration. I'm happy to talk to you about exactly how the bidding process worked, what are the downsides of the bidding process that led me to this result. Uh, um, so uh, the states impaneled the hospitals. The impaneled hospitals uh, have to agree to a price list. We talked a little bit about that. I told you that the system is cashless. There's that smart card, which works just like a debit card. Uh, um, the insurers conduct the enrollment drive, uh, which is interesting. Uh, they're also technically responsible for educating people on how to use it. So that creates some weird incentives, right? So you want to enroll people so you get the premiums might not want to tell people how to use the program because that eats up your premiums. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe in pro uh, profit maximization uh, as a model. Okay, so what's the design? So uh, use this too. So it's, uh, as I said, it takes about, about uh, six years to do this study. We do the listing exercise in 2013. Uh, we do the baseline in late 2013, early 2014. Uh, uh, we actually rushed to do this because we, we were told by the government that there was gonna be enrollment right there. And so we, we worked really hard with the government to get this done, and then the government obviously just takes their time. So 18 months later, they actually go and actually do the enrollment, uh, and then 18 months later, uh, we decide to do, uh, uh, not we decide, we knew that we were gonna wait 18 months after uh, to do the, the midline. Then uh, our school actually ends before our study ends, and so that, that means that when we do our endline, which is uh, uh, nearly four years later, we have to ask about what did you do six months earlier. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that the gap between baseline and midline is not 18 months, it's 18 months times two. Okay, so keep, let's keep that in mind. Uh, I already told you about the enrollment, same method that the government used, but a little bit more marketing, uh, in the sense that we just walk the people to their, to, you know, we tell them that the, that the, that the enrollment truck is there. Um, we actually use the exact enrollment trucks that the government's use, so that's, that's great. Uh, uh, as I said, it's a, a little bit more hands-on, uh, which I pointed out uh, before in my answer to you. Okay? Um, now this is important because uh, 
Uh, Das and Lino have a paper in the very early days of RSBY in New Delhi saying, hey, what if we do a, a little marketing campaign, does that cause an up uptake in, in, util in, in enrollment, and then what is the impact of that? Uh, and their study basically says no big impact, uh, but they're finding that, it, that, that uh, you know, people didn't really know about that uh, program. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to at least make sure that people knew when the truck was there. There's also this nice paper by Bergadol, who's Matrish, uh, is uh, uh, on this paper where they basically find out that people don't actually know, and they're actually working in Karnaka, they don't, act, they don't actually know uh, RSBY, so then they uh, incentivize uh, agents to tell them, and they find that it's good to incentivize the agents to tell them, because that actually leads to people getting information about this. And I already told you about the Panergy at All study, which basically said people had no demand for that SKS insurance product. Okay, so that, you know, this is a really important question because if we'd spent more time, uh, Cindy and I spent a lot of time uh, uh, debating this. Um, the question is, do you use the government's poor marketing or do you do better marketing? If you do the government's poor marketing, it's externally valid, but if you do your extra marketing, then you're testing two things, insurance plus marketing. So we tried to do the minimal amount additional on top of it, and this is what we settled on uh, for administration purposes. So I just want to ask you about your marketing and how you explain the insurance to the households. Because there's one of the weather's insurance studies said that the poor households have a difficult time like assessing this from yeah. the person. And second, uh, they don't like to think uh, that the cops would pay. Mm -hmm. And similarly, most of us don't like to think that you know, my kidney would pay. And so you know, there's a lot of this. I don't want to talk to you about health insurance. Yeah. Just to, I don't want to talk to you about pricing grids or something like yeah. that. So, did you have to overcome some? Problems? No, and, and what, maybe we should have. We did not in this case because we decided we wanted to be externally valid and not separately test a marketing scheme. Um, I, I think an argument can be made that you should do this, and I actually think it would be a very good idea to do a study, whether RCT or otherwise, that looks at the impact of uh, actual education campaigns, and that's another thing that we we uh, quickly talked to Sewa about because they do some of that, and, and I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of complementarity uh, uh, between uh, educating people about a program and the program itself. Um, so yes, we should, we didn't, we used the exact same materials, they did the same flyers, the same bulletins, everything uh, for that reason. Okay. Uh, I already told you about the baseline uh, and, and, and midline. Uh, the only thing I wanted to tell you is uh, so the baseline and midline includes lots, it you know, includes a health module, includes income, includes uh, 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 assets, consumption, uh, mainly it's, it's assets and consumption, not so much the income. Uh, those are all uh, kind of unreliable, the way that we ask, I think. Uh, but uh, it's also the case that uh, for a third of the sample, not for the whole sample, it's too expensive, for a third of the sample we did for the health component, not just objective, but actually objective biomarker. So weight, height, uh, um, uh, uh, we did hip measurements, uh, 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 upper arm circumference, basically skin folds to measure fat. Uh, we actually, it's not on here, lung capacity, uh, blood pressure. So there's a range of things. And basically anything short of requiring us to go to ICMR to get poop. We did. Uh, um, at, at the end line, uh, uh, here we did the, uh, both the baseline and midline, we did the biometrics, but at end line we didn't do it. The other change that happened at end line is at uh, baseline and midline, we basically interview one male, one female, and a child. Uh, um, we don't actually interview the child, we talk to the mom. But uh, uh, at end line, uh, we only interview one household member, okay? And sometimes it's a male, sometimes it's a female. We try to prioritize uh, the male, uh, but then when we didn't get it, we get the female, but we mark that down. And so you, you'll be able to see both male and female results separately. Okay. Two-stage randomization, which was your question, right? So. How do you do a two-stage randomization? In our context, we wanted to vary the fraction of the population that got uh, uh, insurance, and then we want to vary what insurance they actually, the household specifically got. So the first thing we did is we randomized eligible villages in the district to uh, different allocation schemes, okay? Uh, one through five. And then we, uh, uh, in each one, we varied the fraction that was gonna get each of the four household treatment arms, all right? Uh, and the key thing, the constraint was just making sure that we wanted to make sure that uh, basically, it was roughly, even with one exception, double the number of people were going to be in the free insurance arm. And the reason we did that, that was an ad hoc decision because we thought, so our power calculation said that we needed 2250 households per arm. We doubled that for the first arm because we thought that that's the thing that was most likely to happen going forward. And so we just wanted like kind of an arbitrary additional power in the most policy relevant arm. Okay? So our goal was 40%, 20, 20, 20. 
And we needed that to be across the board, but otherwise we, wanna, we wanted to vary this. And you'll see what typically happens in these situations is we juice up one of the arms, one of the, the specific things. So sometimes it's C, sometimes it's D, sometimes it's A, uh, um, and the last one is a little bit more even. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the assignment, actually, I should have pointed out the first arm there. Okay. So that's the two stages, so the village stage randomization. By the way, the randomization is also a stratified randomization. So first we match villages uh, in groups of five, and then we randomize them. It's actually groups of 20 and then we split them. But um, uh, uh, So we do village matching on the, uh, at the village uh, using village averages and then we randomize. Then we do the exact same thing for uh, household level. We match households, clusters of four, and then we randomize them to the four arms. Right? And these are the four arms. Yeah. Does that make sense? Idea here is that we want a good, uh, uh, you know, kind of eliminate as much noise as possible uh, 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 by using matching and combined with uh, randomization and then do it in a two-stage framework. Um, there's a separate paper uh, that uh, uh, Kosuke, uh, Jang, and I did trying to figure out exactly if you want to do ITT and TOT estimates in this context, exactly what assumptions you need on non-interference for that to occur. Also, if you want to estimate, I should say, what you need for that to occur, that, that's already in the literature. What you need, if you want to estimate spillovers in that context, what assumptions you need on non-interference so you get a, a, a useful spillover assumption. So we will reference that here, but that's in a separate paper. Uh, in JASA. Okay. So ITT estimates, this is not surprising to anybody. It's outcomes regressed on whether or not you're uh, in the, the specific household arms, the share of the households that are treated in any form of access, not just share per specific arm. We did other variations. It just would get very, very complicated if I were to present all the ITT estimates. So in this specification we're showing you is the fraction of the people that got any access. They need in, the interaction between the two. Okay, so IJT index uh, household villages and time. Why is the outcome? I already told you that, that this is an indicator for household condition and that's the share. Um, the direct effect, by the way, of uh, providing people insurance is just looking at the coefficient that's on whether or not you got you household got the insurance. There's a spillover effect, uh, which is the effect of uh, the coefficient on the share plus the interaction of the share and whether or not you've got household access got to be you getting access then interacting with the share, right? And there's a uh, like an a intercept uh, and then there's a slope on that. So that's uh, pretty easy. This is the uh, paper. Uh, so if you want if you want to measure this, the assumption that you need is that uh, the assignment in village J prime different than the village you're looking at does not influence J's outcomes, okay? So assignment in other villages don't affect the outcomes there. So it's a partial non-interference assumption that's required for that to be uh, an unbiased estimator. Uh, that, by the way, that paper also has uh, the exact variance uh, uh, so estimator. Pardon? Within, within village, not across village. In fact, the assumption required to estimate this is that there's not still over across villages. Okay. Uh, and the total effect is the sum of these, except we multiply it by. So you might just say let's sum both of those, but that's actually an out of sample prediction because the largest fraction of households that get insurance is 0.9, so we multiply by 0.9. At least that's a number that's within sample. So 90% of the household getting access to insurance. All right. Um, if you want to, you can increase that a little bit uh, uh, if you think that that's more policy relevant to go to 100% being treated. But we tried to be a little bit more conservative from an economic perspective. Okay. TOT. So now you're looking at outcome regressed on whether or not your you household enroll. This is the fraction of the households in the village that enroll, and then the intersection between whether the the, the, uh, not the intersection the uh, interaction between whether your household enrolls and the fraction of the village uh, that's enrolling. Okay, uh, so those are these two terms. Now, what are the instruments we use? We use the fraction of so we use whether or not uh, you know uh, you as a household got access. That's our uh, first instrument. Uh, the instrument for the share, in some sense, is the fraction of the households in the village that got access. And then the, 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 the uh, uh, instrument we're thinking about the share, obviously we use all of these for all the, for the first stage regression, but um, it's the interaction between the fraction that got the, whether you got access and the fraction that got access. Okay, and so that's the structure. Uh, direct effect is unsurprising, it's the coefficient on whether or not you enrolled. Spillover effect is the share plus the share times that whether you enrolled. Uh, the uh, uh, assumption that you, um, uh, need in order to get a bias test comes from the same paper. There's the, got to be no access to enrollment spillovers across villages, okay? Because we're measuring within village spillovers. 
Um, and the total effect is the sum. We change the amount that we multiply the indirect effect uh, to 0 0.8, 0 0.78, because that's the highest number we see in our sample that a uh, fraction of households did a role in the population. Yes? Yeah, um, uh, uh, if you just try to break down the, say, the share of households who are uh, treated to the at the street level, if you just try to do that, would the data become very thin at the street level? Of the village. What do you mean at the street level? Uh, uh, I mean that uh, see, uh, interaction between different households would also depend on which street they live on because yes. you might have some social restrictions on who lives where. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, now, a few things help us. We're looking at APL, and so if you think that, for example, they cluster on by caste and that there's a correlation between caste and income, then it might help because you're more likely to live next to an APL household if you're APL, and you're more likely to be a BPL household if you're BPL. So, and that's but we don't actually have the data, so I can't tell you the extent to which physical proximity or social proximity affects this. I think that'd be a very interesting uh, thing to look at. Uh, so, like you know, you look at all the people that are doing network uh, things like Arun, etc. And, and if you could mix that with the uptake, I think that'd be great. Um, we have talked to uh, uh, NHA about doing stuff like that, but it was done pre-COVID, and then obviously the COVID shock hit, so that project went by the base of wayside. Yeah. Um, just to follow up to what he said, so when you're looking at APL households, so the experiment is taking period over a period of around 3.5 years or so. So it's possible that a lot of households that are been on the borderline have moved to India. Yes. So if that is the case, then this effect may be, may assume some mark from because the income cost, um, so the question is whether or not if you're close to the margin and you moved over, that changes your physical location. Yeah. So I think that's a little bit less likely. Uh, but we do know that that happened because we observe uptake. Like we asked, do you have an RSPY card? And all of a sudden, some people in the control group start having an RSPY card because of this specific thing. By the way, it's not only because you become poorer. It could be an election, and uh, it's good to hand out benefits during the election. So we see a lot of that, too. Uh, um, that erodes some of the, uh, like that is to say, bridges the gap. Now, you could, I don't know if this direction you're going with this, but one problem with that is that it's reducing the effect that you're seeing. Uh, all I'm showing is kind of the differential given that it's possible that the control group is also consuming uh, care with the help of an RSV like heart. Okay. Yeah, so we will go a little bit faster. Uh, balance, so there's a lot of variables that we have that we can test balance on. The standard approach is just kind of uh, run all these things, look at your p-values, and see if the distribution of that looks uniform. If it's uniform, you're fine, it looks fairly uniform. So I think that there's a uh, pretty good balance. Uh, I think we did the, the randomization. Uh, uh, seems, seems copacetic. Uh, summary statistics, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, uh, again, I think that these are folks, that these villages look uh, uh, a lot like the villages that we see. Obviously, we don't have a reference point for uh, thinking about uh, these specific households, but the means and the sample that we've got uh, look uh, pretty representative. So, the villages, the, the yeah, the villages we select look like the villages in the in the district, and the households look close to the means that we see for households across uh, uh, a district uh, in say census or NSS. Uh, I'm, uh, time permitting, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, healthcare consumption and why that differs in this versus, say, NSS, but we'll get back to that. First result is effects of insurance on access. Uh, so I already told you you have higher take up than RSPY. Uh, we think that it's because of better marketing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because we already talked about that. Uh, so you can see that uh, in sale of insurance. Uh, so 60% is just a number that came from before. And then you can see even in our sale of insurance number, we're getting, once you add, directed spillover effects, you're getting a 60%, uh, which is uh, the same as what you've got with free insurance for BPL. Uh, so um, now you might ask yourself, well, there, even if you look at the free insurance arm, 80% take up, but that means 20% did take up. Uh, you know, what's going on? Are there potentially frictions, whether it's lack of knowledge, or even in this context, just not being able to get to the, not being home at that time? What is the, the reason for that? We don't investigate that much, but it's worth uh, investigating a little bit more why I'll take it there. Uh, by the way, for those of you that want to benchmark, in the United States, with Medicaid, which has been around for decades, we still have uptake problems. And 80% would be great uptake into Medicaid. Okay? Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure that it's something that you saw over time um, uh, easily. Um, so uh, one question you might ask, which I think is an important policy question, is like, all right, well, what do I... Yeah. 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 
Assuming that they don't pay out of pocket. Right. Yeah. And there might be like health information or something negative. So, for example, the fact that you know, I didn't get treated, now you know, I've taken bad habits because on, say, you know, food intake, diabetes, and so forth, and I'm spreading those around. I'm wondering if that is a possibility. You, so it's interesting, it's usually the other way around that people make this argument. They make the argument on moral hazard, once I get insurance, then I've got ex ante moral hazard, which is I then start smoking and eating fatty food and etc. So that's a little bit different than that there's some evidence uh, in not the Indian context that there's an ex ante moral hazard which go the other way, and then we just could plug in the teaching, and in fact it would maybe go the other way. The guys that don't get insurance learn it from the people that got insurance. We don't ask that question. It's potentially possible, interesting. Yeah, my prior on this is that, that uh, uh, you know, knowing about habits is not new. Like I know if you eat, have fun, smoke uh, BDs and, and eat fatty food, that's not new, but insurance is novel. And so you might imagine that the learning on insurance is gonna be a little bit bigger than this other stuff. Uh, also the evidence on ex ante moral hazard and maybe, you know, like what the impact. So on one hand, I would, I would look at like Jishnu's work on, on not big impact, of course that's primary care. And then in terms of ex ante moral hazard, the coefficients on those are very small. So we like to note them because you know, fits our economic model, but the, but the magnitudes are not large uh, on the ex ante moral hazard. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think the thing that I want to stress here is, is is just a pure fiscal planning point. What if, if I provide paid insurance, or I sell, sell the insurance, right? So the government's not putting any outlay, I get to 60% to, uh, uptake. If I pay for insurance, I get 20 percentage points, but I have to take all those inframarginal guys that we're going to buy anyway, I got to pay for that. And so you might ask, is that worth it? And that, that I think is a, is a good way to think about it. It's just to get 20% more, you're paying for 80% of the population. Uh, and that's, that might not be uh, uh, worth it uh, in this context, unless you're getting good health benefits from those extra 20%. That's really the calculation you want to do. My takeaway from this is you can get pretty far by selling it, especially as you're, if you don't have distributive concerns and you're working your way up the income scale. Uh, we should really think about that. Uh, as, a, as a policy option. So in the US we call it the public option. It's a sold option, not subsidized. Um, the demand elasticity uh, that we get on, as you vary the prices on, on insurance is negative 0.314. That's well within the literature on this. So India is not, uh, you know, its demand curve does not look that differently, that different than the demand curves we see everywhere else uh, for this. Now that's really interesting because if you think that people don't know how insurance works, which you're gonna get through the utilization stuff, you might ask yourself, which we don't know and have an answer to, is why does the demand curve look like it does elsewhere where people are more familiar with insurance, but then utilization doesn't? I think that's a good question. A bit of a puzzle. Okay, so result two is the effect on, on, on utilization. Now, I want to separate out two things. There's insurance utilization and healthcare utilization. Why is that important? Let's suppose that you find insurance utilization, but you see no change in healthcare utilization. One possibility could be I just went from out of pocket payment to insurance payment, but my healthcare consumption didn't change. So my health won't change, but my financially I'm a little bit better off. Right, maybe, uh, if you think that that, that, that uh, by the way, I have a separate paper that points out that out of pocket doesn't mean that you didn't smooth, at least the way that we measure it. You could have borrowed and, and, and saved uh, for that sort of thing. Okay, that's fine. But it would tell you, for example, whether you're better off with insurance as a smoothing mechanism versus loans, uh, for example. Uh, so that's why you want to think about these two things, insurance use and healthcare use separately to measure both. Uh, what we're going to find is that the use of insurance rose, the use of healthcare did not rise. Uh, at least statistically significantly. Um, so again, consistent with the, the message that we're getting out of, first, the studies done in the United States, suggesting that uh, uh, um, insurance provides mainly financial benefits, and importantly, the other countries where you're seeing uh, the same sort of thing, no changes in health. The main difference is, uh, in those other studies, in the US, and in uh, a subset of the studies that are uh, done in low and middle income countries with RCTs, do see an increase in utilization, no impact on health. So those seem to say, in fact, that uh, you're getting, uh, you know, the healthcare that is not that valuable that you're getting on the margin with insurance. Uh, whereas what we're saying is, is maybe there's just no increase in healthcare utilization, it's just a financial benefit. So that's why we're not seeing a, a healthcare benefit. Okay. Um, by the way, we try to directly measure out-of-pocket uh, uh, payments. Uh, you're thinking that if you're switch, you, you should see a decrease in out-of-pocket payments. We do not see. Uh, that it falls. One possible explanation, which is the work done by Radhika Jain, uh, uh, I think uh, in her job market paper, 
that basically maybe there's balance billing that's going on, and so there's actually increased out-of-pocket payments that goes on within uh, uh, within this group. But there's also uh, prior work that's been done at the World Bank uh, across a range of countries that uh, suggests that, in fact, out-of-pocket payments increase uh, with insurance. And here's the reason why. If I decrease the price of something, say phones, and I subsidize it, you might consume more phones, right? But if I don't fully subsidize it, you might end up buying more than you did before. So it's quite possible uh, that out-of-pocket increases. The key thing is, the translation is, at least your utility is a little bit higher because it lowered the price of this thing. Does that make sense? Your surplus has to be a little bit higher. Um, so that's kind of the way that I would interpret this issue of not seeing out-of-pocket payments decline. It's a very narrow view of what, uh, 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 you know, what insurance uh, is doing. Yes. Uh, well, be okay. What I'm saying is that I do not find, so I find that insurance use increases, healthcare use doesn't change. If, if, if I was very kind of accounting about it, I would say, well, then I should see that out-of-pocket payments fall because your healthcare consumption doesn't change. But before you were paying out-of-pocket and now you're paying with this subsidized insurance or at least this insurance program, right? So your OOP should fall. And what I'm saying is actually, if you think about it, it's a little bit more complicated. One is just like the, the just the pure reality that maybe these hospitals are supposed to only be charging the RSBY price, but instead what they do is do the balance billing. We've seen this in Rajasthan, maybe that's going on here, but that's a pure administrative issue, like people are violating the rules of the, of the contract uh, and the state can't enforce it. Or alternative is that what's really going on is that uh, people are consuming more healthcare because the price of healthcare went down and there's some things that are not covered by RSBY, and so that shows up in OP. So like, let me give you a great example of this. Uh, this is kind of underappreciated about public hospitals. You're supposed to get free care, but as it turns out, if you go to public hospitals, um, they are short, they spend too much money on labor. So this is work by Shuboroi. They spend too much money on labor and not, don't have enough money for consumables. So if you go, people often have to come with their own band-aids. They have to buy this, the, the bottles with the anesthesia, things like that. So if that's not covered, and you have to do that for some things, then you can imagine that if I consume more health care, I'm gonna get collateral price costs too, and so out of pocket goes up. Can I distinguish between the two? In this study, you cannot. But both are plausible studies, but both are plausible explanations. Okay. Uh, now, before it was on access on utilization, now we're gonna talk about uh, uh, treat, uh, uh, effect of uh, um, actually enrolling on, uh, um, on healthcare use. Uh, we do, again, find a very similar result. Uh, with, and I wanna talk about this, I already talked about this. Um, uh, Households are more likely to use healthcare if their neighbors did. So the thing I want to specify, uh, uh, highlight is the following. So in these tables, what we're typically going to do is different outcomes on utilization and their successful use. We'll get to failed use in just a second. You have a control group uh, mean for reference point. Then we show you the direct effect, which we talked about, the coefficient on the household uh, enrollment indicator. Then the spillover effect, which is the share plus the share times with the household enrolled. And what's interesting about it is that when you look at healthcare use, uh, both in the short run, but also in like say 3.5 years, uh, it is not significant on its own, but it's significant, or sometimes it's even negative, it's significant once you account for the spillover effects, okay? Or it's positive once you account for spillover effects. So we do see evidence that on the use side, uh, both in IPT and TOT, uh, that uh, whether you utilize depends on whether or not the neighbors uh, utilize, okay? Uh, so uh, that might affect your marketing strategy uh, in villages. What you wanna do is you wanna get some people utilizing so that then other people start utilizing. So that's a strategy for perhaps increasing utilization beyond just telling people how insurance works. Um, well, we see it on successful use. We don't see it as much on, on failed use. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, so we, I mean, I just chose to highlight it down here, but you, you're gonna see it up uh, in successful use here. Uh, and the key thing to remember is, I'm not saying that, that the spillover effect is significant. I'm saying the overall effect is significant conditional on having that spillover effect. And without it, it's not often. So like, take a look at your direct effect, confidence interval, potentially negative. Here, also negative, but when you sum the two up, it's significant. Uh, the, 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 the information part of it was the real story. Showing up more distinctly as well as successful. And I, that's, and you are saying 
Failed use spillovers are small. They're negative. We're seeing the spillovers mainly in positive use. In fact, we tried this other thing. It's like, as we tried a variation of this, which is a little bit different than what you're asking, is does failed use, higher rates in a village, lead to, sorry, does failed use at, let's say, one point uh, at, one, at uh, 18 months lead to uh, less use at 3.5 years? And we, we, there's no, that's not, there's no significant correlation there. There's not a correlation there. Okay, so there's the spillovers. The thing that I want to highlight that's important, that's consistent with the, uh, you know, uh, Banerjee, Duflo, Olkin, uh, 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 and Rima, I think, was in the paper. There's one other that I'm missing. In Indonesia, they find that it's very hard to have uptake into insurance. What we're finding is that there's uh, uh, people uh, say that they tried to use the card but couldn't use the card. Uh, and that's at a, at a reasonable clip uh, here. So it's uh, 3.5 percentage points uh, and then 1.4. At uh, the most serious uh, uh, event at 3.5 years. Okay, uh, we've done a survey. I don't know if we'll have time to look at it, but uh, you know uh, that sh that shows that both supply and demand side uh, factors um, are likely to to play a role. One really interesting feature that's worth exploring uh, is that failed use was lower for Group C that uh, for for the for, for for Group C, the group that actually paid for insurance. So when you pay for insurance, you're less likely to have failed at utilizing insurance. So that, there's an interesting uh, angle there to explore. We don't do it in this paper, but in the paper uh, that Cynthia is leading, uh, we do do it. Okay. Impact on health, few positive significant effects. Uh, we considered 82 outcomes for both males and for females at, at one point, at 18 months and at 3.5 years. Just multiply that out. That's a lot of outcomes that we're looking at. Um, there's like three to five that are statistically significant. You saw the, the spectrum of them. We did not obviously show you all of them, but we randomly picked some outcomes and put it on uh, a coded plot so you could kind of see what the spread looks like. Consistent with other studies I told you before, you know, uh, uh, potentially there's not changes in healthcare use. That's why you're not seeing an effect. I think that's probably a pretty good uh, argument. Another possibility is low quality care. Obviously, Doc's talking about primary, but maybe it also extends to, to secondary, by the way. This is a big concern of the NHA is whether or not these hospitals are doing a good idea, good job. It's, it might be like uh, instead of low quality care, it could be poor experience with the system. And so, you know, when you go to hospital, you don't have those. Uh, and any tertiary care yeah. requires like multiple visits. Yeah, it's grouping all that. It could be the, the physician was bad, it could be the facilities were bad, it was the overall experience was not coordinated. I agree. Also, very important to, as we decide to invest more money to explore. I agree. Um, now, the important thing to remember is just because I don't find significant effects and sometimes positive, sometimes negative, that's not, you can't conclude from that that there's no health effects, right? Uh, you know, the uh, on average, uh, the health effects we see are about 10% of standard deviation. That gives you a sense of how big. Uh, um, you know, potentially there could be effects uh, going on uh, in this. Uh, so I, I, wanna, I want to interpret this, I want you to take away from this, you know, this could be a power issue um, more than anything else. It's a separate issue than the long term, because this is even at 18 months and 3.5 years. Okay, so you, one must be modest about these, uh, these studies, even though it's large. Okay. Uh, I already talked about adverse selection. I want to make sure, because we only have about a minute left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump uh, ahead, so I already told you about the adverse selection. You'll see more on that hopefully as we go out. Um, uh, I'm gonna jump ahead, but I, I wanna sum up since we're down to one minute. So, uh, uh, tooting our own horn is a very large experiment. Uh, even if you don't think it has power, to, uh, it's getting big on the RCT side. So 11,000 households is pretty big. Uh, over 3.5 years is, 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 I think, pretty big. Impact on uptake and insurance use, but not on healthcare use and not on health. Little evidence of adverse selection. We talked about that very quickly. Um, um, I think the lessons we I, I take away, that we take away from this, is that uh, it's likely that health insurance, at least at this level of knowledge in the economy, and this portfolio of healthcare utilization that we see among households today, uh, or let's say in the last 10 years, health insurance probably still has uh, primarily health benefits, which is really interesting because that's also what we're finding uh, in other countries that are higher income countries, so it's for maybe for a different reason. Uh, uh, maybe people don't know that they're supposed to use the product, whereas in the United States, um, they're just substituting, their healthcare consumption doesn't change 
or it increases, but it's not uh, you know, flat of the curve medicine or something like that. But it, it does mean that health insurance primarily has financial benefits. Uh, I think marketing is something that's very important to, to, to consider, uh, both avoid the failed use, but uh, basically you, you can make the argument that why aren't you utilizing more in 3.5 years? Again, marketing can help with that. The third thing uh, is uh, there's planning benefits here, which is might make sense to start thinking about, about charging for insurance um, as a way to make insurance affordable uh, for the government. The government would then just be basically saying, especially in rural areas where you don't see private insurance markets because it's not uh, particularly cost effective for private companies to go to, that's where the government ought to go in and provide a public option. Does that make sense? Um, okay, that's it. The rest is on time, hopefully. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, you do have a flight to catch? Yes, at 7 7.30. Oh, I, I, I thought it's only like 30 minutes away, but maybe rush hour? Actually, initially tried to work with them to say, all right, how can we help improve that particular database? I think that that uh, you know there've been some efforts since then to improve that sort of location. Uh, you know, Aadhaar was at some point thought to be a, a way, and then there was the issue of the Supreme Court opinion. Now there's an effort to build a health stack connected to uh, a more broader ID that will then uh, that you can use to better better access people. Another interesting thing, we had a lot of political pressure. To go easy on enrollments, so reduce our eligibility. Eligibility. Yeah, yeah, we had that too. So um, in 2013, we did a census listing, and uh, our our uh, and the census listing was we asked people, do you not have BPL? 
Okay, we got a very large list of people that didn't have VPL, and so then we thought we'd go back down and be able to find people. But uh, uh, between March when we, that happened and September when we started baseline, there was an election. They just handed out VPL cards left and right, and so the actual fraction of the population that was in our census that, that had VPL was much higher, and so eligibility, like the number of people that the, uh, the exclusion criteria rose. So, well, I want to I want to see if the PhD students had any particular questions. Yes, please. So uh, you were talking about like the use of insurance in but not of healthcare. Yeah. But insurance is for you know, like the healthcare facilities that we are using. No. It's connected in the It can be connected, but you have to remember that just because you don't have health uh, insurance doesn't mean that you can't pay for care. No, you are talking about those people who have uptake who have taken the insurance right? and their healthcare facilities so, so think about it this way. Um, I like to think of two groups of people. One group of people that were going to consume healthcare anyway, and they financed it some other way. They either had, they had money in their pocket or they could borrow uh, the money, right? Uh, and the second group of people that weren't going to, weren't going to and that just didn't have that capacity. They're liquidity constrained, uh, for example, or they were just financially constrained. Okay. Uh, in the first group, all you're going to do is have a financial impact. They were going to consume care anyway. All you do is done is, for example, substitute loans. You took out loans and put in insurance payments. For the second group, you're on the margin, uh, going to increase their care because you've increased their wealth uh, or you solved their liquidity problem, right? And what we're doing is basically measuring what fraction of the population falls in each of those groups. And I'm simplifying, obviously, it's a continuum. And what we're basically saying is that the second group wasn't a large fraction of the population, and the first group was probably it. Does that make sense? In the United States, by the way, that, that's not perfectly right. In the United States, what ends up happening is that uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is the case that it's mainly financial benefit. And the reason why it's financial benefit is that people uh, without insurance still got the care. Uh, they got it some other way. Uh, we can talk about how they got it, but they got adequate care. They also did increase healthcare utilization, but our takeaway has been in the health economic literature in the United States is the increased utilization, the value of that care is zero. So there's just you know extra care, more care than you need to actually improve your health. Does that make sense? So it, it's a little bit more complicated in the U.S., but I like to think of these like as two simple buckets that you want to think about. Are most of the people fell in that first bucket, which is they find, financed it another way, now they're financing it through insurance, but the healthcare consumption doesn't change. Because the Indian would like to think that people normally are you know very depressed when it comes to going to the healthcare facility. Yeah. Their diagnosis is actually very difficult. Yeah, so that the gloss that that puts on that is that demand is low, but it's low incorrectly. That had they know what the, that they knew what the value was, they would utilize it a little bit more. And now I think that's a little bit dangerous still. Uh, I think it's easier to make in the healthcare context, but let's look at, for example, in the private context where you don't have to, like in a you're just you know everything's out of pocket. I find it uncomfortable to say that uh, they don't demand healthcare enough because you're telling them how much to value health relative to their other consumption. And that's based upon what we think their health is, is valued at, not what they think their health is valued at. So I can't do that. But I think you have a more compelling argument when you say, I'm going to give you free access to healthcare and you're still not utilizing it. I mean, it's price zero. You should definitely utilize it. I just need a little bit of positive health benefit and you should use it, right? Obviously, health insurance doesn't cover everything, the time, cost of going to the facility. Okay, that's fine. But as I get it close to zero, people are still using it less than it's up, like there's positive health benefits, then your interpretation is correct. Does that make sense? And I think those are all questions to explore. Uh, I, I still think healthcare and health insurance is an understudied subject in the low income and middle income kind of contracts, particularly in India where there's a lot of action on it. Yeah. Do you have any consumption data at that time? Uh, consumption of non medical? Yes, we do. So, I mean, do you see anything in terms of uh, that consumption of other goods? Uh, there is a yeah, so we, so the short answer is uh, no with a lot of noise. Uh, um, we initially did this because we wanted to measure variation in consumption. So we wanted to see if there's going to be fluctuation in consumption that would decline. But again, we're only measuring at 18 months and three years. And so that's not giving you a lot about variation because you're only seeing basically, you know, two uh, data points. So you can see if they're the same or they differ. Uh, but there's a lot of noise and that sort of thing. So the short answer is we don't see a lot of change in we don't see a lot of significant change in non-medical consumption. Uh, 
the income of MACTV to the transfer is very low, and then, uh, or at least we, don't, we can't detect it, and then it's also the case that, that we're not seeing any real patterns in the, you know, is consumption smooth? Um, but you can push back on that to say, I don't expect consumption to be smooth over a one point eight year period. Uh, 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 between a 3.5 minus 18 month period. I'm just trying to also think about the spend the same for the cost of healthcare in India. Is it that because of different ways that healthcare is provided, a lot of it is informal, a lot of it is unregulated, etc. Therefore, the cost is actually very low. I mean, I'm, uh, and therefore, we're not seeing that impact. Or, I mean, control is still able to get uh, get a yeah. But I would want to separate out primary from secondary care in that context. Like when I, when you, when a lot of the examples that you, that when you said those things, I was thinking like there are great examples of that in the primary context, like Ayurvedic care, but then not so much for acute care. Like you go in for, uh, uh, you know, uh, C-section. You could do it at home, I guess, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, so I mean, because we do know that the cost provision do basically, like insurance and something. Yeah, I don't think, so uh, I'm not going to fully answer your question. India's experienced high enough health care, medical price inflation, to the extent that you trust the, the numbers on medical price inflation, it's hard to measure. We, if you don't have a full census, it's very hard to measure what the health care price uh, inflation is. So India is a very high rate. It looks like the rate that the United States had uh, in the 1970s and early 80s, uh, and it's been declining uh, since uh, in the United States, but India has a high rate of medical price inflation. Does insurance contribute to it? I doubt it because I don't think insurance uptake is very high, at least at the aggregate level. Um, certainly our study is not going to contribute to it. Now does that mean theoretically that's not going to happen? I don't know. I think it's quite possible and I think one wants to try to avoid that. But there we're just relying on theory and experience of other countries, not anything I know about anybody. Just the last question yeah, I just yeah. said, you talked about health care costs and you keep on hearing about uh, U.S. coming around to the United States that's the GDP on healthcare. Mm -hmm. And India is a little bit smaller, right? 1.5%. So I think you know, we are probably comparing apples to China. So that kind of a situation seems to be the probably you know, the data that is captured. The expenses in the U.S. is very different than what we have to take into the healthcare. Yeah. And the only way to think they're able to do the report on the same parameters on the two sides. Yeah. We really know as to how much India is spending on the healthcare. Yeah. Because US, if US is spending 80, 19 percent of its GDP yeah. on healthcare, that means they're covering a whole lot of things which no. are not covered. They're just paying higher prices. But so I'll, I'll say two things. First is, uh, I think a first order, there's a little bit of debate on this, but I think that there's close to consensus on this. The US doesn't, for example, take it, the US versus UK. U.S. spends 18%, uh, U.K. spends 9%. Okay, so double. Um, but if you look at quantity of care, UA Reinhardt has a nice article on this called It's the Price is Stupid, where they compare quantity across the two countries. Quantity is consumption of various things are the same. A few exceptions on diagnostic tests, but for large ticket items, the quantity is the same. Prices in the U.S. are double. The standard explanation is that our labor prices are double. Okay? Or, 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 yeah, doctors are incredibly well paid. Uh, it, it, that actually explains my uh, story. My parents went to, it's a classic story, went to America to be doctors there. So uh, we did. Because cost for you know, healthcare providers is also probably very easy. Yeah. But I will tell you the following thing. Uh, you're exactly right that you, you know, you've got to be very cautious about comparing what happens in the United States or even Europe to what happens in India. You need to study low income countries. But I will tell you that, you know, the drunk that looks for, for his keys up in the lamppost? still rational to look for the keys under the lamppost because you can't really find things elsewhere. So at some point, we're stuck with comparisons of the US where there's just way more studies. And you can maybe find something a little bit closer if you're studying early part of, of US healthcare history, so think 65 to 1980. It, that's a better comparison, I think, for India. I think that's roughly where we are in this country. Right. Yeah. But you're fundamentally right. They're two different contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.